So once again, uh, we are going to talk today about alcohol and the sustainable development goals. And um, Movendi International has been looking at the sustainable development goals uh, from the time they were adopted in September 2015, or actually even before that, because as we all know, this was a a uh, very comprehensive process uh, that lasted like two years that has led to this uh, final um, final 17 sustainable development goals that were then adopted in September 2015. And the question is like, okay, what do the sustainable, sustainable development goals uh, have in common or what, to do, what, what do they have to do with alcohol? Uh, so one... Uh, one goal is rather clear, even though it was not given that alcohol would actually be part of the sustainable development goals, but uh, we can find alcohol under the SDG number three, target 3.5, which, which says strengthen the prevention and treatment of substance abuse, including narcotic drug abuse and harmful use of alcohol. And also the indicators are very clear. One of them is actually measuring alcohol uh, per capita consumption. But today we are not here to talk about the SDG three only. Uh, we are going to look beyond and also the whole series is actually going to uh, look uh, beyond the goal number three. And that has that's something what Movendi International also has done. And so what we have done is that we have looked at all goals and actually on all targets that, that belong to the goals and looked at the evidence uh, showing any connection like between alcohol and then the targets that are there. And uh, we have then concluded that 14 out of 17 sustainable development goals would not be achieved uh, if we do not do anything about uh, alcohol harm so I will take you uh, shortly uh, through that because, uh, and what I have done is that I have actually uh, grouped the, the goals into three categories as we are also looking at the sustainability from the perspective of social sustainability, economical and um, environmental sustainability. And that is uh, only because of the, of the limited time and space that I have to talk about this. So I would really recommend that you would have a look at the, at the material that we have produced, Alcohol Obstacle to Development, where we are going through all the goals and all the targets and, and showing some evidence and presenting also some solutions. Uh, so when we look at the social goals, those would be, they, they would be like end, ending poverty, ending hunger, uh, quality edu providing quality education, uh, achieving gender equality, uh, uh, re reducing inequalities, um, sustainable cities and communities, uh, peace, um, let me just move this, peace and justice and strong institutions and also providing uh, society free from fear and free from violence. So when we look at these goals, then, then we can see uh, like alcohol really is an impediment for many of them. So when it comes to poverty, for example, then we know that alcohol uh, either pushes people in, uh, in, into poverty or uh, keeps them there. And uh, there are in studies that, for example, have a case from Sri Lanka where we could see that 10% uh, of male respondents in the studies are using as much or even more than their income for alcohol. And then what we also understand is that when, uh, in, especially in poorer uh, groups, uh, what is happening is that alcohol tends to crowd out uh, other, um, other more uh, beneficial uh, spending, like for example, on education uh, or, or healthy food. And uh, then when it comes to also uh, equality for everyone, then we, uh, there, are, there is lots of evidence about connection, for example, for uh, connection between uh, uh, alcohol and violence and uh, violence against uh, or violence on women specifically, but also violence in domestic violence uh, in, in homes. And then um, when it comes to the inequalities, then it's also connected to the poverty, as I have uh, mentioned also before, that uh, the people from poorer uh, communities or groups also, even though when uh, if they use less alcohol, uh, they tend to carry um, uh, bigger consequences or bigger burden. And uh, then um, also, when it comes to the cities and the, and, the, and the space that we are creating, we can see that the number of outlets uh, of in the 
in poorer communities is, for example, higher uh, than the, the well, uh, those, those uh, better ones, better off. And then so and the number of outlets, of course, has impact on alcohol consumption and also on alcohol harm. And uh, then we can see that when we reduce the number of opening hours, for example, just by two hours, then the number of homicides is decreased. In the, one case in Colombia, it was with 25 percent. So we really can see how this is uh, these, these goals are actually connected. Uh, then if we move to the, the next category, and that's the environmental ones there, the countries have committed themselves to protect the planet, uh, work on sustainable consumption and production, and also uh, do or take action, urgent action on climate change. And here we really need to, again, consider uh, what, uh, how much, uh, for example, water is spent on uh, alcohol production. So when it comes to wine, it's uh, more than 800 liters that are spent, on, 800 liters of water spent on one liter of wine and uh, around 300 uh, liters of water spent on production of one liter of beer. And then we understand also that really the production is uh, uh, really uh, provides burden on the on farmlands uh, on the bio biodiversity uh, and for just uh, an interesting fact that uh, the all beer uh, production in Australia um, has produced so much pollution as if we would have um, if as if we would make forty eight thousand uh, car rides around the world in one year so the the impact also on the environment is huge. And then when we come, then we look at the economic. Um, uh, aha, here this is actually very important to say that when we look at also where the where alcohol is actually produced, and it's very often produced in uh, environments that are that that have water scarcity. So this is a quote from a CEO of an organization, Surplus People Project in South Africa, uh, that has said that uh, the alcohol industry is exporting our water in the form of wine. And the wine usually goes to, uh, to European countries where people have access to water. So just so some people in Sweden can uh, use a little bit of wine on Friday evenings, uh, the people in, for example, South Africa, in this case, cannot even access uh, water or the, the little water that is that they have is used for alcohol production. Uh, and then when it comes to then the economic uh, group of the of the SDGs, uh, then it's, of course, the providing the decent work and economic growth, and then also looking at the partnerships between economic operators and uh, governments, for example, and other, uh, other stakeholders. And there we can also see in the latest OECD report that has come out just a few weeks ago now, uh, is showing that, uh, that alcohol harm is, will contribute or is contributing to 1.6% GDP decrease in the, in the coming 30 years in OECD countries. And uh, because of the loss of, produce, uh, the loss of productivity because of alcohol, uh, there is a loss in 595 billion USDs. Um, and then what is also important say, to say when it comes to the, the partnerships with different uh, economic uh, uh, actors is that the tax taxation that would actually be a very good uh, source um, for development and like for financing sustainable development that is, uh, uh, is very often undermined by the producers of alcohol products. So and like, OK, we have done this kind of analysis to do two things actually to describe the problem and to see uh, what is uh, happening uh, but also to uh, to to start mainstreaming alcohol policy then in the sdg or in agenda 2030 and at the same time also to show the potential of alcohol policies and actually motivate governments to start investing into alcohol policies and uh, the speakers that will follow them after me and the, the other series I believe that they will just prove the case and and will provide much more evidence on how how this is possible and inspire them the governments uh, to invest into alcohol policies more than they are doing right now and here is just this is just to demonstrate that also based on the analysis we can see that alcohol policy is a catalyst for SDGs 
And this is, this is I, I really don't want you to read this right now, but it's available. This was a Movendi's analysis, how alcohol taxation actually would contribute to different uh, SDGs, like uh, when it comes to better education for kids or gender equality or, or inclusion or also eradicating poverty or uh, hunger. Um, everything that the UNDP does on alcohol is in partnership with WHO. Um, so really it's, you know, there's, there's far more um, expertise on alcohol policy and the health impacts of it, um, you know, in, in the participants that I have, but I'm happy to share some of the leakages that, that we've made between alcohol control and other development challenges. Um, so really why, uh, you know, as a whole, is the UN interested in alcohol control? Um, the first one, first reason is the, the significant health burden. And that really should be enough. The burden's so huge that there, you don't need reasons three, four, five, these ones. It's just the, the burden is enough. It's what we should be doing. We should give every country the chance to strengthen its alcohol control policies and to implement them effectively. But there happens to be other strong rationales for doing so. There, when you Reduce alcohol consumption, there are co-benefits with other sustainable development goals that, that Christina just very well outlined in her presentation just now. Um, alcohol taxes are a really undertapped source of financing for development. Um, the COVID pandemic's given us a, a you know, real strong incentive to look for new sources of development to close some of these fiscal holes. And taxes, excise taxes on alcohol are really an underutilized source of that as the um, the IMF, the World Bank, and some other international financial institutions have been pointing out in recent months. And then finally, it's important just to make sure that we ensure coherence among uh, health and commercial policies. It's, it's one thing to have plenty of activities and, and official development assistance projects to support better lives, increased choices among people. Um, and if we're going to do that, we need to not privilege commercial interests over health and well-being. Um, everyone here really um, acutely aware, I think, of the, the impact, um, the health impact of, of alcohol consumption. The old numbers that the WHO has that I think are about to be updated, um, 3 million deaths per year attributable to alcohol use, um, heavy episodic drinking, um, a fifth of women and half of men participating in it. Um, the graphic here, I forget who I borrowed it from, but I think there's someone on here, um, shows just really how widespread the, the sources, the primary causes of death um, that are attributable, attributable to alcohol are. Um, then this 13.5% of total deaths among 20 to 39 year olds really shows the, the way alcohol affects the most, you know, traditionally most economically productive sectors of society. Um, the overall disease burden with 5% of the global disease burden, which is equivalent roughly to uh, HIV AIDS. So really, if you think about the attention and investments we put in fighting a disease like HIV, that's every bit worthwhile and every bit of that investment is, you know, is, is worth it. But if you look, compare that to really how difficult it is to get any traction for global programs to reduce alcohol consumption, it really makes a stark contrast. And then the knock-on effects from alcohol um, use with the, the way it's interlinked with unemployment, driving inequalities, loss of income, public safety, and people's disabilities as well. Um, just to show the trends, the, the, I think this one even may be a couple of years old, but these are the WHO numbers by region um, of alcohol consumption per capita, and just the overall trend showing that things are going up. Really, the, the only the higher income countries and regions things may may be reducing a bit, but overall the, the trend globally is for more consumption rather than less. And then again, this one restates a lot of uh, what Christina presented earlier, but just the, the interlinkages between alcohol and these other SDG issues that a lot of people might not think immediately of the these strong linkages, but really. 14 of the 17 goals being adversely affected by alcohol um, and all of these specific pathways listed here on the left. I'm happy to share the slides after because I know I'm going pretty quick. 
Of course, we need to talk about the linkages with, with COVID-19. Um, the, there's really the, the cycle here about how alcohol, one of the key drivers of, of non-communicable diseases, which of course are associated with worse COVID-19 outcomes. And then part of, you know, even aside from that, the way alcohol reduces immune function and affects people's behaviors in a way that makes them less likely to observe uh, public health precautions. And then on the other side, on the systemic level, the way COVID-19 has disrupted NCD services in, in many countries. I think WHO did a survey um, sort of in the, the height of the pandemic last year, and it was two thirds of countries were reporting this NCD services were, were disrupted by COVID-19. And then going the other way, we know that the way that the, the measures in response to COVID-19 have led to stress and the confinement, the way people have had their lives disrupted. In many places, there's been an increase in alcohol consumption that can at least be partly attributable to that. So as the UN, what are, what are we doing about it? Um, WHO are leading a new initiative um, with with Movendi and the Global Alcohol Policy Alliance, NCD Alliance, with us at UNDP, uh, Vital Strategies, um, to really choose, you know, what is the, the sort of blueprint for countries who want to strengthen their alcohol control policies, where to start, how to do it, um, how do you build the advocacy and build a movement to get these policies um, up to the recommended levels. Um, we've, we've started with the five most cost-effective um, interventions. Um, these are uh, restrictions on retail availability of alcohol, advancing drink driving countermeasures, uh, facilitating access to screening, brief interventions and treatments, enforcing bans on uh, alcohol advertising, sponsorship and promotion, and of course the, the most cost-effective one, raising prices on alcohol by using excise taxes and pricing policies. So this is the, the initiative that we're, we're getting moving at country level now. Um, and we're, we're taking advantage um, of a few of these different um, measures, but the safer, safer Partnership, trying to help countries implement the WHO Global Strategy on reducing the harmful use of alcohol, and then placing it in the NCD response as well. Um, I think the NCD response covers probably half of the harm related to alcohol. Um, but in terms of just where to organize ourselves and respond to it and where to place the, the policy levers in country, it makes some sense to center it on the NCD response in countries. And we chose these five interventions because they're cost effective. And we've, we've done some investment cases on NCDs that I'll get to in a second. But um, if we pull out those five interventions in countries, um, over 15 years, we're looking at a 5.8% return on investments. Um, which is really significant in terms of the public health measure. Even if the return was zero um, and there was no economic gains from doing it, we would still recommend the policies because we want to save lives and improve people's health. But when you have the health improvements plus a significant economic return on it, it just makes the rationale for acting now that much higher because the sooner you start the measures, the sooner the positive returns come in. So these NCD investment case findings, if we were to aggregate the, the first 12 that we did, um, and they're in the, the light blue countries here, um, just the alcohol intervention measures that are recommended there um, would generate an additional $19 billion. Most of that in avoided economic productivity losses, some of it in averted health spending, but we find that the healthcare costs associated with this are far lower than the economic productivity losses. And we could get close to a million lives saved, um, or at least deaths averted, over 15 years just by doing these. And this is only in the 12 countries, but we have plenty of other countries that are in progress right now. Um, so we're looking forward to building that out more. What we're all do also doing as part of the SAFER initiative is expanding into alcohol-specific investment cases. They start take what we have on the investment case uh, modeling. So we have the, we look at the cancers, the cardiovascular diseases, so heart attack and stroke, diabetes and lung disease. And then those five interventions we have already. And that covers again, about half the disease burden as, as far as I understand. And we're going to add to that um, revenue projections for alcohol specifically, and then a, a range of the other disease and conditions that are attributable to alcohol. Um, and here we've got liver disease, road traffic accidents, 
tuberculosis, self-harm, the list is quite extensive. And in parentheses there, you can see the attributable fractions um, of, for mortality. So, you know, if you were to take TB, uh, most people don't associate it with alcohol, but one fifth of TB deaths can be attributed to alcohol um, directly. And then it goes on, these, these go down to even, even HIV deaths, which again, if I remember right, it's still close to half a million deaths a year, 3% of them attributable to alcohol. COVID-19, I don't know if we'll be able to find enough literature to, to make a solid attributable fraction there, but we wanna make sure we do. And we're also doing mental health investment cases. Um, and some of the things we're looking at there, we can tease out the relationship between alcohol and things like anxiety or depression or psychosis. And so some of this work um, stems back to uh, an initiative that we did a few years ago. And this was, again, it was WHO, UNDP, uh, GAPA, uh, Movendi, um, where we looked at you know, the way countries were linking policies on alcohol and their policies on HIV and gender-based violence, because there really was a, an interesting dynamic between those three issues. And this chart shows really how, how much stronger the HIV and GDV policies are compared to alcohol. And even though this was probably four years ago, I don't think much has changed. And so this is one area, area we really want to make sure we can give good attention to helping countries strengthen their national alcohol strategies. And we know that in many countries, uh, the countries that do this, the, the policymaking process is often sort of intercepted by the industry who have their consultants who go in and draft alcohol strategies for countries and submit them directly. Um, sometimes they're even adopted, but they're really, these are the ones that focus more on voluntary measures and things that are just very soft and focusing on the, the consumer, focusing on social responsibility and really ignore the proven cost-effective measures that WHO and others are recommending. So, what are some of these directions and, and open door for anyone who wants to work with us on the, these issues? Um, we're, we're just getting going now, but there is some action happening in countries. We want to build out over the summer these investment cases. My colleague, um, Rachel, who's on, on line as well, she's drafting the guidelines right now for these investment cases with a team of maybe 15 other colleagues from different organizations. We want to get these national alcohol strategies in place. We've got a draft toolkit that we're finalizing right now to help countries do this. Um, legislative reforms also will look into best practices and strategies for working with parliamentarians to get alcohol legislation through, and then how to effectively forecast um, tax revenue um, from increased excise taxes on alcohol, as well as other, we're lumping it with what we call health taxes, which is, um, other taxes on tobacco, alcohol, sugar sweet beverages, fossil fuels, and some minerals as well. So again, just to give this um, sort of you know rationale for moving quickly on it, um, we've, we've done some, some research looking at the, the sort of I guess the, the juice that can be squeezed from increased alcohol taxes and they're really significant. In many countries, it's the highest, the most you know, fruitful place that countries can go to get big revenues to close some of these COVID-shaped fiscal gaps. And really, the one thing we need to keep in mind as well when looking at these taxes is, is that they are pro-poor. I mean, any, any consumption taxes are on their face going to look regressive uh, because the taxes great, make up a, you know, a greater share of the income of someone at the lower end of the income spectrum. But the, the sensitive to the price changes, um, the, the demand elasticity is such that we know that the people at the lower end of the income spectrum are going to have their behaviors changed more by price measures. And then therefore the, the health benefits from the changed consumption patterns are going to accrue disproportionately to those populations. So really this is why you know, these, these health tax measures are an effective means for achieving SDG 10 on achieving inequalities. So thanks for the, the time to speak with you. Happy to take any questions and open door to anybody who wants to work with us on this. Thank you. I want to particularly pick up on Dudley's point about promoting coherent approaches to addressing the SDGs by, by picking up some governance dimensions, which um, draw on work that we're doing within the, uh, within the Spectrum Consortium. 
Sorry, I'm afraid my slides aren't being very helpful. Okay, good. Um, so during the course of the next 20 minutes or so, I just want to uh, really talk about how the alcohol industry have been engaging strategically with sustainable development in, in recent years, particularly through a lens um, looking at governance dimensions. So I want to be looking particularly at, at, at goal 17 here around partnerships for the goals, which have a very strong emphasis on partnership on multi-stakeholder approaches, on collaboration across public and private sector with civil society, and on collaborations as preferred mechanisms for, uh, for achieving the sustainable development goals. I want to demonstrate how that's creating some important strategic opportunities um, for alcohol companies, which, you know, broader inadequacies in global health governance aren't really offering us a lot of protection against. Um, I want to suggest that those the, the problem is becoming particularly acute in the context of the COVID response, uh, with alcohol companies having launched a number of, um, of initiatives uh, and partnerships, and with COVID potentially serving a kind of legitimating function in strengthening emphasis on partnerships moving forward. Uh, and I want to end by suggesting that there are elements of, of Goal 17 of the, and of the SDGs more broadly that we can kind of appeal to in building more effective governance for alcohol, for global health uh, and for the SDGs. Okay, so a number of you will be very uh, familiar um, with the ways in which alcohol companies have been positioning themselves as kind of engines of development. Uh, in recent years, and I may well have kind of stolen these images from a, a number of colleagues on the call. I think a, a dealer will be particularly familiar with the the, the fairly notorious Beers for Africa um, uh, initiative launched by South African breweries a few years ago, in which uh, SAB partnered with uh, a local um, a Stop Hunger NGO uh, in order to generate funding for student meals via the purchase of alcohol. At an international level, we've had big initiatives like Stellar Artois partnering with, uh, with Water.org uh, and obviously AB InBev have recast the sustainable development goals as smart drinking goals in fairly high profile um, initiatives. Um, again, we can see this playing out at company level in some very um, different ways. I wanted to look at uh, Diageo um, briefly in this context, um, where they're one of 17 global companies who are um, including a number of, uh, of ultra food, uh, sorry, um, ultra processed food companies uh, who have positioned themselves as the, the business Avengers to highlight the crucial role businesses have to play in hitting the targets of the, of the SDGs. Now, in addition to demonstrating that, you know, the, the Marvel Cinema Universe really is scraping the bottom of the barrel, um, the, what I think is, is interesting about this particular framing is the very close linking of promoting positive drinking with goals around championing inclusion and diversity and I think this is a really powerful lens through which to demonstrate the interaction between engaging with sustainable development uh, and core strategic objectives particularly around marketing to women which I'll, I'll return to later in the presentation. Um, so if we put this in a governance context again, you know, goal 17 is, is the, I think that you know, in many ways the most important part of the sustainable development goals because it's the, uh, it's the governance underpinning for the SDGs as a whole, though it tends to be pretty uh, neglected. There's a whole host of aspects of, uh, of this goal which are, I think are really important from, um, from an alcohol perspective, particularly the, the commitments around, uh, around trade liberalization, which I, I hope will get picked up in, in future sessions. Um, but I, I want to focus in particular on the emphasis on partnership, uh, which runs across um, uh, across Goal 17 with commitments to multi-stakeholder partnerships to mobilise and share knowledge, expertise and resources, encouraging and promoting effective public, public, private and civil society partnerships. Um, if we look at the UN high level meeting um, on NCDs, the political declaration that came out of that is just full of commitments to public private partnerships as preferred modes of, of achieving um, health goals, with the notable exception of, uh, of except for tobacco, of course. Uh, and at a broader level, partnerships are being presented as, you know, as not just one way forward, but as the only way forward. And I think there are a number of 
particularly kind of concerning dimensions about this as they relate to uh, to alcohol. So uh, Dr. Tedros at the, the World Health Assembly uh, a few years ago suggested that we must use whatever partnerships are open to us in whatever way we can to achieve our goal. We have to believe in partnerships. That's the only way. Now, the, the emphasis on belief in partnerships in the absence of much evidence of their effectiveness in many contexts is, uh, is interesting. But I do think that the emphasis on partnerships is also of particular concern in relation to, uh, to the alcohol industry and to WHO um, in the current context. Um, this is, of course, really important to uh, to alcohol producers who have put a lot of effort into positioning themselves as as partners in progress uh, in the SDGs. So alongside the uh, the, the UN uh, high level meeting a couple of years ago, uh, we had you know the great and the good led by David Navarro moderating a meeting on behalf of um, of the beer industry on uh, advancing the SDGs a partner's perspective. Pretty difficult to imagine him doing that for a number of other companies. Um, the International Alliance for Responsible Drinking has produced a number of, of very helpful guides to uh, for, com for governments and civil society in order to build partnerships um, with the alcohol industry. Uh, and I, I, we've been particularly interested in mapping how this is playing out in the context of, of the COVID response and, and the rest of this presentation draws uh, on a collaboration that we had with NCD uh, Alliance in order to really try and map how uh, a series of unhealthy commodity industries have responded to the COVID pandemic. Um, and thanks to the many of you on this call who I know contributed to, to this initiative um, last year. Uh, and we were interested in um, how corporate strategies utilized the uh, the COVID pandemic with respect to marketing and promotions, but also particularly with more kind of non-market dimensions around the use of corporate social responsibility and philanthropy, around shaping policy environments, and I think particularly importantly around pursuing partnerships with a whole series of actors uh, and the uh, demonstrating the real value that's being placed on demonstrable and public collaboration. Um, this is in the context in which I think it's important that we understand that a whole series of philanthropic initiatives by, um, uh, by alcohol companies, as with ultra-processed food companies and other unhealthy commodity industries, have very clearly been used in, a, uh, in the context of COVID-19 to advance core strategic interests rather than simply to contribute to response efforts. Uh, and, you know, that's very evident when we look at, a, at an international level, at AB InBev, for example, where if you go to their COVID page, that's very much badged around more ways in which we are part of the solution, positioning um, COVID response as part of a much broader capacity or claimed capacity um, for AB InBev to work with governments in developing countries to achieve shared objectives. And we can see this in Peru, in Ecuador. Uh, in India and claims to stand in solidarity with our communities and governments. Um, and when you begin to kind of unpack these uh, a, a bit more, it doesn't be, take a lot of work to begin to see a fairly clear fit between, uh, between philanthropic initiatives and core strategic goals. So in particular, uh, an emphasis uh, on, um, on appeals to, to women uh, and appropriating the language of gender diversity and inclusion uh, in order to reposition companies as uh, alcohol producers um, as appealing to women, particularly in key emerging markets. This is an example of an initiative launched by Perno, the Perno Rico India Foundation, so the philanthropic arm of, of Perno Rico in, uh, in India, um, where they launched a high profile Corona Hacks um, uh, initiative uh, around uh, women entrepreneurs. Uh, and it's a nice way of, of demonstrating what we might term the kind of two faces of alcohol philanthropy. So on the one hand, you've got the kind of uh, the, 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 you know, the, uh, the publicly appealing face uh, of appealing to development and women and philanthropic uh, initiatives. But it doesn't take much probing to see how this fits with, uh, with the bottom line. Uh, and it's very clear from Perno Ricard's um, statements in, in more investor oriented contexts that the appeal to women uh, is driven by the, the need and the commercial opportunity to 
um, uh, to increase sales uh, of their products to women in key emerging markets. So um, in this context, proclaimed progress around uh, around including women in senior leadership roles is very clearly driven to the commercial need um, to, uh, to, to tap into the highly sensitive minds of their ever-growing number of female consumers. Um, and there's a number of, of equally kind of questionable partnerships emerging in the context um, of international NGOs as well. So the leading humanitarian international organization CARE has since 2016 been collaborating with, um, uh, with Diageo uh, to address, bar address barriers to gender inclusion throughout the Diageo value chain. Um, uh, and this has been given a new spin in the context of, uh, of partnership with, uh, with Diageo in COVID response, um, with claimed contributions to, uh, to reaching people in 69 of the 100 countries where care works, providing clean water, uh, very extensive um, uh, claims around around basic provision, as well around as meeting challenges around gender-based violence. Uh, and again, to go back to Dudley's um, presentation, this attempt to reposition discourse around gender-based violence and alcohol is clearly of of the utmost strategic importance in a number of uh, of emerging market contexts. So the partnership between Care and Diageo is very clearly framed around promoting women's empowerment, positioning gender-based violence as a symptom and cause of gender inequality, violence against women occurring because of unequal power between men and women and stopping women from fulfilling their, their potential within the value chain. And of course, that's a very important part, a component of, uh, a, a, of analyzing gender-based violence but serving to shift the narrative away from engaging with alcohol in these contexts is clearly of, of strategic value. Um, and it, it's just, what I think is particularly interesting in this context is the idea that COVID is um, both seen as kind of increasing the financial imperative for partnership um, because of finance constraints, et, et cetera, but also in terms of, uh, of legitimating new, maybe more contentious partnerships and collaborations. So a number of you may have heard about the, the new WHO Foundation, which has essentially been created in order to generate resources from, source, from, uh, from commercial actors and other sources that WHO itself has found difficult to engage with for a number of reasons. And there was quite a bit of attention recently to the WHO Foundation accepting a donation from Nestle, um, you know, notwithstanding Nestle's very long history of, of breaching uh, the International Infant Formula Code. Uh, and I think this, it's not a coincidence that it was, it was COVID-19 that was seen as kind of legitimating this, this sort of function. Um, and uh, this is important, I think, in terms of going back to that broader emphasis on partnership in global health and thinking about WHO moving forward. And again, the WHO Foundation is really very unclear about um, its position in relation to the alcohol industry. Uh, and indeed, that seems to be shifting somewhat. So if we go back to March 2021, if we look at its its gift acceptance policy, um, the alcohol industry was positioned in the red category alongside tobacco and arms. But by April, it had shifted to an orange category in which assessment will be conducted on a case by case basis. And the criteria, in the absence of any criteria really for assessing how that will operate. Um, uh, and you know, this, this is part of a much broader story of efforts to, to illustrate uh, or to interact in partnerships with key global health actors. Um, but I particularly wanted to mention the partnership with, with the Global Fund between Heineken launched in January 2018 to demonstrate that there's nothing kind of inevitable or inexorable about these. These are a, a process of political decisions made by actors in global health to partner. Uh, and this one became so embarrassing that it was very quickly um, very quickly suspended. And I think that there, there is a real uh, importance to challenging these inappropriate partnerships um, as they emerge. Um, and to thinking about what aspects of the SDG agenda might we use uh, in promoting more coherent approaches um, to alcohol health and development. So I think that the you know part of the goal three that is important is the idea that um, uh, that we are committed to strengthening capacity of all countries, in particular developing countries, 
for management of national and global health risks. And I really don't think it should be beyond us as a scientific and advocacy community to position the alcohol industry convincingly as constituting national and global health risks. And in particular, to kind of leverage the commitment to enhancing policy coherence for sustainable development. There's a whole host of ways in Christina and Dudley's presentations that clearly demonstrate that, that um, the, the current positioning in relation to the alcohol industry is incoherent and likely to undermine effective health policies. And of course, there are other contexts like Article 5.3 of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, where some of these issues uh, are, are managed and addressed in slightly different ways. But, uh, but we don't have to wait for a Framework Convention to uh, in alcohol to begin to try and manage conflict of interest in order to promote uh, more coherent approaches to health and sustainable development. And here, I think it's it's also worth drawing on recent um, initiatives in trying to manage conflict of interest in nutrition policy, where, again, yet there's nothing resembling a framework convention for nutrition policy. But in the context of, uh, of pressures for partnership, there's been a, a sustained attempt to develop safeguards against possible conflicts of interest in developing policy and implementing nutrition programs. And it ought to be possible to learn from that experience in developing similar approaches to more carefully managing interactions with the alcohol industry. Um, I'll just about end it there, but I will end with a shameless pitch um, to, to ask for yet more contributions to a, a second wave of our um, crowdsourcing initiative with the NCD Alliance. We've made it much easier to engage with um, this year. Uh, and those of you who've seen recent initiatives like the Budweiser initiative launched with Joe Biden in connection with vaccines will, I think, understand the, the potential significance of mapping these responses effectively. Thanks very much um, for the opportunity and very happy to answer any questions. There are real challenges um, that is being experienced in uh, countries of the South. Um, around uh, moving our governments to look at alcohol as an impediment to development. Um, so just maybe as, as a background, um, a key issue is, is that uh, the African continent in, and Southern Africa uh, is uh, at the moment a bit of a playground for the industry um, that uh, less than, more or less 30% of, of people drink in, 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 in the region. But of those that drink, almost 70% of them drink at uh, uh, heavy episodic levels. Um, but Africa is also home to young people. 60% uh, of the population is under 25. And it's estimated that by 2050, 50, that would increase with 50%. Um, we've also home to an increase in middle class with disposable income. Um, and, and these, um, just in the past two weeks in South Africa, we've had a, 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 an example of a new club that has opened in Soweto um, in the middle of, of a COVID crisis. Um, and with their launch, one of the bowls uh, that was shared with us from that launch from one table, uh, people spent 138 million, sorry, 138,000 rand. Uh, just on alcohol. Now, that's that's uh, for us. That's that's beyond comprehension. Uh, the amount of money that's available to be spent on alcohol. I mean, I, I think a key issue is that there's limited regulation, in, and and Dudley showed uh, the chart around uh, the policies that has been adopted in the region, um, and uh, within our network, only three countries thus far has got policies. Um, and so for us, we see big alcohol as a, another way of colonization um, and that the competition between the, the three big, the, the, the big three, but particularly in the Inbev and Heineken um, is, is a real challenge. Um, I think uh, in addition to that is the issue of the industry relationship with government. And, and we've got a challenge where our, some of our governments uh, own shares uh, in these companies through the development corporations. Now that creates a particular problem for um, when Dudley points out to the issue of coherence of policies between health and commercial interests. Um, and, and how do our, our governments struggle to manage uh, these different roles? Um, but we also have uh, our policy makers uh, involved on the boards 
um, of the NGC. So in Namibia, for instance, uh, uh, the governor of a key region uh, is a board member of the Namibian brewery. Um, and then of course, there's the issue of partnerships. And, and, and I think that's what uh, Jeff's focus uh, on, uh, around partnerships is the issue of how the industry has successfully been able to convince our governments that they need to partner with the industry uh, to push a particular agenda and the one and agendas that suits uh, the industry. So they, they like to focus on underage drinking um, and road safety, um, uh, not, take, not taking on the issues of availability, pricing and, and, and marketing. Um, and the, this relationship uh, that the industry has with our governments uh, uh, is, is complicated by this, by SDG 17, um, because that, that, is, that is the narrative that the industry pushes. And it's also, the it's, our governments have completely bought into uh, the, the notion that the only way that they can, uh, the only relationship uh, that they can have with the industry um, is partnerships. And then of course, the, the issue of complete um, absence of the acknowledgement of conflict of interest um, in those relationships. I just thought that I wanted to share an example of how the industry uh, uh, position themselves uh, as contributors to uh, the SDGs. And so this was taken from the Namibian breweries um, and how they have set uh, the contribution to five of the SDGs. Um, and um, this will be shared so people can, can read it. Um, but I think that there's also the issue of uh, conflating uh, CSI and SDG activities. Uh, so you, you, you sometimes not quite sure uh, how it needs to be read. Um, so there's a, there's a big emphasis on youth entrepreneurship um, across the region, um, issues of education. Um, and then of course, the, the, the whole issue of responsible drinking, which we know is, is problematic. Um, uh, Jeff referred to the Global Fund uh, Heineken partnership. Um, in Namibia, this had taken place where the uh, Heineken distribution network was used to distribute uh, condoms. Um, but uh, uh, there's, there's also the issue of, and uh, Jeff referred to uh, how the industry um, look at positioning themselves and, and yes, GBV is an issue, but environment in our context uh, is also of particular uh, concern. Um, so uh, in Namibia, uh, the Namibian, Namibian breweries has looked at uh, um, what they call blow the horn on the rhino poaching, uh, which is also appealing to uh, people in, in the North. Um, and then there is the issue of water usage that Christina referred to. Um, and their contribution to what they see as, as, as cutting their water usage um, uh, in, uh, in the production of, of alcohol. Um, and in, the, in Zambia, we've seen them directing crop, crop uh, production away from traditional crops so that, so that uh, farmers serve the interests uh, of the industry and grow um, crops that, uh, that they would use uh, in the production of alcohol. Um, but I think for us, the, uh, the industries position themselves as, as contributors to SDGs, but at the same time, on the other side, uh, they are uh, involved in activities that is particularly problematic. Um, so we've seen the production of larger sized beers uh, so we, we, we're seeing one liter and 1.5 liter um, beer containers. Um, so uh, SAB started with a calling black label uh, um, of one liter and then Heineken followed and they just increased that, okay, we can do better. And so now we've got a 1.5 liter uh, beer uh, in South Africa. There's the whole issue of feminization. Um, and again, Jeff referred to that, but in South Africa, there's a, South Africa and uh, the reason why I refer to South Africa is that South Africa, unfortunately, uh, what happens in South Africa has a ripple effect in the region. And so when we see the production of um, beers or the feminization or looking at youth audience, uh, that gets emulated uh, uh, in the region, but also transported via uh, the media platforms. 
uh, into the region. Um, and then there's, of course, because of our, our, our youthful audience, and this is a more sophisticated example of ice lolly, um, but it's uh, so the, the, the black and white uh, uh, ice lolly. So it's a gin and tonic. Um, but, but that's uh, a 50 year old is not going to go for uh, ice lolly. Um, ice lolly is, is targeted at young people. Um, and so the industry is very, really, clever in how they are exploring um, products that would be appealing to the market that they are after. Um, and then of course, some of the, the, the particular problem around marketing, uh, uh, branding of pubs and taverns, uh, huge billboards are still uh, the order of the day. Um, but we know that there's an increasing uh, footprint around social media um, and a particular problem where they are, the, 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 the kind of social media is more interactive. Uh, they, they're using competitions as a way to engage young people um, in uh, adding uh, it to their own social pages. And then we've got the problem of brand and ambassadors of popular cultural uh, and sports personalities adding their voice uh, to uh, to the the industry uh, advertising, and then of course uh, sports sponsorship. So if any of your rugby fans, um, the, uh, the 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 rugby cup, the upcoming um, one, uh, this is how it's branded. It's in your blood. Um, the lion CD is a celebration of best rugby. Um, blah 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 blah. But the key issue there is is that it's Alcohol is promoted as the product that brings South Africans together. Um, uh, and for a country where less than, uh, only about 31% of people drink, um, this kind of positioning uh, is uh, problematic. Um, because it, it does become the, 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 the major narrative around alcohol, but, but it's actually not the true reflection of the consumption patterns in South Africa. Um, and then, of course, the issue of, of promoting self-regulation. Um, what is problematic about it is that our governments buy into it. Uh, so last year uh, uh, in South Africa, they, they launched a commercial code of communications in partnership with the Department of Trade and Industry. Um, and so there's, uh, and, uh, uh, and this is reflected in, uh, across, across the region. Um, I think the issue around policy interference and, and pressure from the industry uh, is, is probably our major uh, challenge. Uh, so we saw in Botswana that resulted in a decrease in the tax um, and an increase in sales hours. In Lesotho at the moment, they are delaying the conversation around the, the, an, an alcohol tax levy. Um, and in South Africa, they've successfully been able to stall uh, the passing of three legislative, uh, legislative pieces. Um, that would uh, uh, regulate alcohol better. Um, and then maybe just an example in Zimbabwe last year, uh, within 24 hours of the government announcing uh, COVID measures, uh, government withdrew uh, uh, those uh, measures around alcohol. Um, and we had the immediate uh, announcement of a significant contribution from the industry uh, to government uh, to support the COVID measures. So maybe just, uh, and, and I think this is what uh, you want to hear about, about South Africa. Um, uh, the challenge is, is that the narrative has been of job creation and a key economic contributor. Um, and this is despite the fact that we know that uh, the South African society spends about 248 billion rand on alcohol harm, uh, whilst only generating about 97 billion in the revenue. Um, They've been successful in mobilizing uh, small and micro retailers and traders uh, in a liquor traders association. Um, but the convener of this trade association is paid by the staff. Uh, so it's actually not a, a, a it's not an organic um, independent uh, 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 rallying of people that work or that is affected 
uh, by, or could be affected by regulation. Uh, but it is, it is something that is being instigated by the industry directly. Um, he's, he's extremely, it's one person, and he's extremely successful um, in uh, pushing a particular narrative. Um, uh, the challenge with that is also that um, the majority of people that's involved in micro and small trading um, are black South Africans and black women. Um, and so that's a very particular uh, audience uh, that our government is very um, careful of in how they engage and uh, particularly uh, if it comes to regulating, um, given the policy of black economic empowerment um, uh, and some of the historical issues that the country is uh, uh, um, dealing with uh, in terms of transformation. Um, there's been uh, significant social media campaigns uh, trying to put forward this voice um, of the people that would be affected if regulation is introduced uh, in South Africa, but particularly during COVID, how those uh, um, people were being affected. Um, and then there has been uh, an extensive, uh, almost PR campaign uh, around job loss and economic loss um, to the industry. Uh, we, we, every day in the media, we see how the industry is losing millions. Um, but uh, just in February this year, Distel announced that they had a 14% increase in profit uh, for 2020. So uh, the, the, the narrative that they are pushing versus uh, what is the real experience of the industry is, is, um, is different. Um, and we've seen them flying in uh, international experts uh, or have international experts write opinions, uh, and of course people, um, experts in South Africa questioning uh, the expertise of these people. Um, but uh, it's the, the fact that they have this very snazzy PR traditional media campaign means that all of those pieces get placed um, and uh, every single newspaper in the country uh, runs some uh, piece every day. Um, around uh, the impact of, of, of regulations on the industry and how that would increase the, the, uh, the economic challenges that the country is facing. Uh, about two weeks ago, it was announced that we've got a 32.5% uh, unemployment rate. Um, so the, the context in which they are promoting this narrative uh, feeds into uh, uh, the problems people experience on the ground but also the challenges that our policymakers have to meet uh, some of the, the, the needs um, um, of, of, of um, South Africans. Um, and then they produced a report, uh, which we call a report. They, they pushed it as a, a research paper. Um, and, uh, and to essentially uh, one that wasn't peer reviewed but to counter the evidence that was being produced by the South African Medical Research Council, um, in particular, um, some of you know Charles Perry, um, questioning uh, some of the evidence uh, that was uh, emerging uh, out of um, the regulations. Uh, so we've had three bans, um, and it's been very clear that when there's a full ban, we have almost 50% drop in trauma admissions. Uh, well, 60% admissions to, to our hospitals. Um, and when the ban was lifted, uh, that went back to normal rates. And in, in fact, in the December, January period, that went beyond what we traditionally experienced. Um, but uh, that was a very big piece of uh, PR campaign on their side to try and push the fact that uh, the evidence that's emerging is not scientifically uh, um, valid. They engaged a mathematician uh, um, uh, to, to relook at the figures. Um, and then of course they uh, threatened legal action. They've taken the, the, the government to court and that case is still ongoing. Um, and uh, our understanding of that is that uh, 
they are wanting uh, the disaster management clause in South Africa uh, explicitly states that the government can uh, introduce measures to control the sale and distribution of alcohol. And, and uh, we think that that's the particular clause that they want to remove uh, so that if there's any future national emergency, uh, that's not something that's open uh, for the government to act on. And then they've disinvested, they've, they've invested both Heineken and the InBev, withdrew significant uh, um, investment uh, uh, um, money. But this week, SCB has come back and said, okay, uh, we'll reinvest. Um, so there's this, this uh, what I see as a very abusive relationship uh, that the industry has with uh, South Africa. Um, uh, we will do this if you do that. Uh, so don't regulate and we will invest. Um, and the stories for the past week has been, uh, they envisage that there will be no ban and therefore they think it's essential to put money in um, back into some of the operational uh, outfits. And then maybe just the last point, uh, uh, NEDLAC is a statutory mechanism uh, that basically brings together uh, government, labor, and industry. And there's a fourth chamber for uh, development and community, but essentially that chamber has got absolutely no voice uh, in relation to policy. Um, and the industry has been successful in two ways. The one is they use this mechanism to stall the uh, 2017 Liquor Amendment Bill. Um, and through that mechanism, they recommissioned another socioeconomic uh, study assessment, um, and which they paid for. Uh, and when the results of the assessment came out, they completely rejected it because essentially the assessment showed that uh, the country would gain uh, by adopting the Liquor Amendment Bill. And then they fell back onto the economic, you know, economic metrics uh, study of 2015 uh, that basically disputed uh, the use of regulation. So uh, uh, what they're doing at the moment, they, they're using this mechanism to negotiate a compact deal uh, with government. And, and basically that means they are saying, we'll give you 150,000, 150 million towards an awareness campaign. Um, but these are the other things that we want you to do uh, in exchange uh, for our contribution uh, to this. Uh, they're clearly not wanting to go into the direction of regulating availability, uh, marketing um, or pricing. Um, and uh, we still, we, we're trying to uh, intervene uh, as civil society, um, but that's particularly difficult. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, it's tough to say because we're still so in the thick of it, but it opens the door for the conversations. Um, it gives us, you know, something to, to lean on and show the governments have committed um, to achieving these things. Um, you know, the, it, it's easy to, to, you know, get frustrated that the pace of, of um, progress isn't faster. Um, but this is why they're long-term goals that they go out now to 2030. And it wasn't too long ago, it was only 2015 that, that there was no um, target on, on reducing consumption of alcohol or anything related to it. Um, you know, the, the previous development agenda, the Millennium Development Goals was really much more narrow. Um, so the, you know, it really is um, a good step forward for us to have this. Um, and I think it's easy to not attribute, you know, some of the progress that's been made in recent years to this and just think that it's just the natural course of things. But I think the fact that the, the negotiators thought to include this as a, as a target in the development agenda um, really is, is key for us. That It, it just takes away um, the excuse of policymakers to say we don't need to deal with this or it's a separate issue. Um, and the fact that it's it's located in that third SDG on health and well-being really centers the discussion as well. If you sort of step back a bit and see that transformation from the MDGs to the SDGs is a transformation from very few goals 
to pretty much everything being covered one way or another and therefore inclusion is great but the terms of that inclusion can can be a little bit unclear um and the the sort of strategic benefits of that inclusion can be contested because so many issues can claim it but alcohol just has so many things going for it in terms of addressing core strategic needs of government and other actors and we one way and another we haven't leveraged that potential effectively yet i mean i think the sustainable financing um route is the most obvious illustration of that but but the defining challenge of the sdg agenda is to is to find ways of promoting coherence and accelerating progress across multiple goals and there's really very few agendas that have the potential that alcohol does in this space and i don't think that that anyone's done a, a good enough job of uh, of really kind of um leveraging that potential yet again i think the comparison with infant formula is is really important in a, in a number of ways. Obviously, you know, infant formula was kind of the first issue that really um, leveraged a, a, a big new innovation in global health governance in the infant formula code uh, and thinking about the, the role of global civil society in building support for that and the, um, and the kind of strengths and weaknesses of the infant formula code in, as thinking about a, a, a route for for global health regulation in an alcohol space moving forward is is really important too but but again you know that broader point that practices around the supply of infant formula and around interactions with the infant formula industry are so much more developed than they are around the alcohol industry and that that seems odd in a number of contexts I think that our challenge has been is that we have not necessarily used it as a as a rallying point, um, and and that uh, and I think that is generally in the civil society sector. Um, what we have, I ever discovered, is is and and maybe it's because SAPA has been new, uh, but in the past year, uh, the issue of GBV and children's rights, in fact, um, has become more foregrounded. Uh, as a, a rallying point. And so we have more organizations um, joining the alliance uh, because that is the area of, of, of interest. Uh, so the challenge is really up to us as, as, as advocates uh, to look at how we use these different uh, um, instruments uh, as rallying points to engage people on the issue. understanding policy coherence is the defining challenge of of the sdgs and it's it's really difficult you know even in in issues that look comparatively complementary to try and develop approaches that are connected coordinated integrated um and which successfully promote you know health economic development agendas is is really um you know is really messy and, and it does need a a, a lot of a lot of work but alcohol does have a number of advantages i think that um for as a kind of site for policy innovation in promoting policy coherence i think um i mean uh, one of the more obvious things that we can do it, it, which characterizes so much of the ncd agenda is just stop doing things that we know don't work that would that would be kind of quite transformative in in this space and you know so much of uh, of the agenda internationally around uh, around alcohol and NCDs is um, is geared towards things that we know don't really work. Getting rid of those would be incredibly helpful, and I think thinking about governance mechanisms as a way of doing that is, is important. So partnership approaches um, in uh, in alcohol and in ultra processed food are incapable of achieving their core health objectives. They can you know, demonstrate marginal gains on some issues, but they are incapable of, of, of tackling the big drivers of, of those health, health problems. So that's a, a kind of starting point. I think you know, we need to think about connecting alcohol. And I, I know this is something that, that Mavendi and, and colleagues in IAS are very interested in as well, connecting alcohol with the broader commercial determinants of health frameworks and thinking about developing more coordinated approaches across unhealthy commodity industries. But then if we take it down to kind of substantive policy drivers, you know, I think that the big one here is is taxation. Um, uh, and that's the 
the the real card that alcohol has to play, particularly in a context of increasing financial pressures, increasing pressures on uh, on aid. So for, towards sustainable financing.